So let's move on to the next part. As I mentioned at the beginning of our summit, uh, the topic AI is also part of our agenda. And next, Dr. Martin Hofmann will give us some insight, how, uh, some insight on AI in the context of enterprise. So welcome back on stage, Dr. Martin Hofmann. Welcome back. <laughs> Thanks for, thanks for taking the time and um, for the next 20, 30 minutes to talk about an area that I'm absolutely passionate about. And not only myself, but an entire team we have around the world working on artificial intelligence. And I want to spend a little bit um, time on telling you what we do beyond the autonomous driving. So we're not going to talk about, I don't want to talk about autonomous driving at that point, but show how um, AI is applied in many different areas in, in our company. And I also want to give it a little twist, maybe the ethical topic around artificial intelligence. At least I want to try to highlight a little bit on it. It's something we have to keep in mind because we're dealing with human beings, exposing them to new technologies, and the impact is something that we have to, to be aware of. So one of my favorite books is iRobot by Isaac Asimov. Who in the audience knows that book? The older generation like myself, because this book was written in 48. In 48, Asimov wrote a book where he talked about robots with so-called positronic brains, like a wired thing that he couldn't um, specify, but we would call it the conscious or the intelligence in the machine. And these robots, and go back, remember 48. At that time, robots didn't even exist. They were just being invented. Asimov was using these robots like moving, moving like the sky objects um, with a brain that make decisions, that communicate and interact, speech recognition. Uh, they even have active speech, how they can communicate. And by the end of his book, like eight or nine uh, short stories, they even start to develop a so-called kind of emotion. So Asimov in 48 had a very far uh, looking um, perspective on, on robotics. And by the way, he talked about AI without calling it AI. And he invented the three famous laws of robotics. One is a robot may never injure a human being or through an action allow a human being to come to harm. That law is number one law of KUKA robots still today. Our robots in the factories follow, this is the number one law why we put fences around robots in our, in our factories to make sure that it's not going to happen. The second thing is that a robot has to obey all the orders given by a human being unless it conflicts with law number one. And the third law of robotics is um, a robot must protect its own existence unless in conflict with one and two. I want to leave it right here because later on I'll get back to that and we are playing around with some ideas of maybe there should be three laws of AI. And I'll get to that uh, in, in a second. When you look at robotics in an automotive company, this is how it evolved. On the left-hand side, you see the Beetle production in the late 50s. Manual work, from an economical standpoint, it's, uh, it's a mess. People would never ever, to, in these times, work in our factories like this, bend over. I mean, um, the position of the body to the object is in the most unoptimal um, uh, position uh, ever. Then we invented the robots. So today, this is the robot production uh, in, in Wolfsburg, 99.9% completely automated. And what happened was that the robot was not there to replace the human being from a cost factor, but from a quality and from an efficiency standpoint and economical standpoint. We had so many dropouts in the, in the assembly lines where people had injuries and, and, and problems with their back that it was not a sustainable model. So robotics was brought in to augment and help the human being because these gentlemen didn't do that job. After that, when the robot came in, they were trained into different kind of functions that they took over. And repeating the same quality was a productivity issue at the same time. But these robots are plain stupid. They do exactly what they are being told. There's nothing intelligent around robotics. And if you look at robot code, robotic code on the left-hand side, it's telling the robot how to move uh, on the XYZ axis in a three-dimensional room and do certain movements with arms. That's, that's it. On the right-hand side, now if you switch to AI, 
it looks completely different. It looks like someone on LSD has painted something. It's a neural net. And the neural net is learning with probabilistic functions in the middle, sigmoid functions, and mimicking the human brain. The funny thing is, in many cases, you don't know how a neural net came to a specific result. It's not possible, in most cases, to exactly replicate what happened. If you take that to the extreme, this is called learning on the right-hand side. On the left-hand side, stupid robot knows nothing except what's being told. So if you take AI, and the spin we're taking to it is, we're using AI in our enterprise to augment the human being. The objective is not to replace. I heard yesterday Jeannie Rometty from IBM at the opening speech, and she made a remarkable statement. And IBM is heavily investing in Watson Technologies. And she said, the moment we use AI to compete with the human being, something like a war that we're going to start. And the war will result in rejection. So the human being will always try to show that it's not working. So we would kill a new technology in a heartbeat. And there are areas where it's happening. If you listen to the discussions around data protection these days, and this is happening. People feel threatened by technologies where they don't understand anymore what's going on. And they might be even replaced by people, uh, by algorithms taking over social interaction, sort of me. But coming back, if you augment humans, there are some examples of how you can do it. That's the only time I'm mentioning autonomous vehicles. I mean, autonomous vehicles is decision making based on complex situations, in complex situations. So an algorithm trying to learn over time how a vehicle operates in its 3D environment and reacts and makes decisions, the so-called drive path. Do I go left or right to uh, get around um, uh, um, something on the street? The second area is detecting patterns, what neural nets do really well. We have several high-speed, high-resolution cameras in our factories that take constant pictures of our vehicles. This is like the paint. And the algorithms learn to detect in a very, very early stage where paint is being off spec, where the paint shop is going out of spec. This is a gradual, slow move. The moment a human being notices it, it's too late. You have to stop the whole production. You go back to the paint shop. You do the adjustments. You clean it or whatever. So the algorithm is learning that a little thing might be only a shade. It's nothing serious. Something else might be an issue coming up. And then it's updating the robots in the paint shop automatically. So it's a learning system. And the human being doesn't have to spend time like this um, um, hanging over a vehicle and can do something else. The other thing is what we call cognitive ergonomics. If you look at people working in office, especially my favorite friends, controllers, I really love controllers, adding a lot of value to a company by counting the numbers. I'm, I know it's, it's fair to say that, but it's a repetitive task. They go through heaps of data information. And a controller has a bad reputation, typically, because that's what he does 90%. Making a smart decision, even if he can do it, is only maybe 1% or 2% of his time. So this is nothing people really like. You don't go to the office every day full, of, full in love with your job, crunching numbers. Algorithms do that, that go into the numbers, do automated scenario analysis, and come, come back with decisions. Say, OK, you have two options, approve or disapprove it, based on, on, uh, on, on the information uh, being analyzed. This is where an employee starts feeling helped, augmented, and is really happy that he doesn't have to do um, laborious, Sisyphus kind of, uh, kind of work. And I'll get to an example later on. The second thing is where we use AI all scenario planning that has become multidimensional. I'll give you an example. How much is a spare part in a specific country? That depends on your cost. That depends on the market situation. That depends on GDP in a country. In Italy, prices are probably different than the UK. And it depends on competition. It depends on so many different factors. So what, what we did is we developed an algorithm that does all of that, that goes actively out six data, uh, competitive information, own internal data, and computes like multidimensional charts, scenarios, what price in which country is best. And it's monitoring the revenue. So if the revenue of a spare part in Italy drops, you probably had the price was too high. It auto adjusts the price in the next planning cycle. So it's learning how price impacts certain um, um, elements and teaches itself to do that. 
So our human beings in aftermarket sales, they have to approve the pricing strategy. That's what they do. And develop maybe a new sales model. But they don't have to go and waste all their time um, uneconomic, cognitive, uneconomic um, tasks. Another example is Diagnose and Heal, software and data centers. And a lot of startups out there doing a great job. Software that automatically heals your code, malfunction as co mal code, and, um, and does it better. So what we do, and we are here to advertise a little bit of our IT labs in the world. So what we do is actually two things. We do basic research with a team of 15 or 15 researchers in Munich. From, uh, we, we, we took them from the uh, Technical University of Munich, deep, deep experts in deep learning, and they do ground work. And one example is data is so important and so expensive in finding, cleaning, obtaining that data has become a critical resource in training neural nets. So the idea is, can you use little data, and out of little data, generate a simulator? And the simulator is generating artificial data. So we are generating data sets, tremendous amount of data sets, artificially, based on learning algorithms, to train and feed neural nets. So if we're able to succeed in some examples, we can save a lot of money and time in getting better results from our uh, deep learning algorithms. Another area we are investing is quantum machine learning. Earlier today, we had a, on stage a talk with um, our friends from Google and D-Wave. We are in a partnership on, on quantum computing. And that's the next, one of the next levels that, that we see where you use quantum computing as an optimization problem in a neural network, where you can use quantum computing to optimize uh, the neurons and uh, the, the values in the neurons of a network and, spe and speed up learning uh, dramatically. Then the second area is we apply AI in the company in different scenarios. Uh, my favorite example is chatbots, bots that communicate with employees and take over the complete business processing for our people. So they speak natural language or type natural language into the computer and manage the process work behind through, through algorithms. And I'll get to that example in a minute. RPA, especially in India, a big thing. And uh, we are also investing in RPAs, the automation of steps in the process. If you combine that with a chatbot in front and a neural net, you have a very powerful, basically indirect working organization. You can simulate all of finance, 80% of the finance organization with these um, technologies. And the last thing is human-robot collaboration. Remember, I talked about the fences, stupid robots. We are working with um, 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 DFKI in, in, in Bremen and uh, Center for German Artificial Intelligence on teaching robots to detect and learn from human physical behavior. So when, when I move to the robot, the robot moves a step away. And the robot learns over time that my move in front of him is only a turn, nothing more. And the third time, he doesn't shy away anymore. Uh, he also detects unnormal um, uh, movement if I go to the side. So the robot senses with 3D cameras your movement and learns and can differentiate between people. What that means is we can take the fence away and can let robots collaborate in close space in very complicated areas, in car assembly, where the robot is sending over components and holds a six kilo uh, component for our um, workers that they only have to push in with a nearly to, to nil force. And that only works at the, because a robot is working, physically working uh, with our people. That's a very interesting area where we put in a lot of work. We have the first robots active that, um, that, that work like this. So one example I, I want to show you is um, we developed in Mexico and in, in the United States for, for, for our companies so-called procurement bot. So what we do is if you have parts below 10,000 euros value, like little fixes or whatever, stuff you buy. We buy stuff for 600 million. We spend 120 billion euros on purchasing every year. Out of that, 600 million is little stuff. And no one has time to care about little stuff. That little stuff, I'll get to that later, the bot gets a performance of 8%. It's like 50, close to 50 million euros a year that the bot can generate in savings. How do we do it? Our people communicate with the computer. Anyone can do it to purchase something. You don't even have to know how to purchase. The bot is 
figuring out what you want and specifying more and more and more what component you want to buy. Maybe it's a special tool, tool for 700 euros. So it, it goes through all the systems and on the web and helps to specify what it is. So you don't have to type in catalogs or an SAP system. The bot is doing that. Once it's clear what you want, the bot goes out, gives it to the third, second element, a vendor bot. That vendor bot has AI built in. And what, what it does is it's negotiating with the suppliers and comparing permanently price offers from those suppliers. And then comes back to our employees with our found three offers. The best one is this. You save 7.9%. You want it, yes or no? Decision is made about the human being. If he says, yes, go, then it hands it over to the third bot. We call it the SAP bot, who does all the, the typing into SAP in whatever transaction. So these three bots work together as a team and basically take away all of that work from our buyers. Average savings in the first uh, attempt was 8%. Like 50 million uh, per year in, in that example, to develop the bot was less than a million euros. So we are talking about a business case that is uh, interesting. And um, the key functions we used is um, NLP, RPA, and a neural net behind it. So it's, everything is automated, and uh, and it's a learning system. It looks pretty sleek. Our designers on the right hand side made it really nice. It's like it's like texting. You can text with the the bot and they don't have to go into, into SAP. And um, so we took a camera and took people out of the Chattanooga factory, out of HR, out of finance, and put them in front of the bot and said, maybe take a video for you, just see how you react, and um, to see how they interact with artificial intelligence for the first time in their life. And this was quite interesting. I hope now it's going to work. Wow, that easy? That's it? Man. You like it? Oh, I love it. I'm like, hey. This will be something people would like. And super easy. It's like using an Apple. <laughs> Just, it's, you don't need to think too much. That's, that's amazing. Fantastic. Um, bot, do I speak? Can bot hear me? <laughs> I was thinking maybe it was like Star Trek or something. <laughs> You're getting there. Yeah, I, there. I was hoping. Just an example. Um, I mean, this shows a no-fear situation. That bot is augmenting our people. There's no threat behind. None of these people think they're going to lose their job because if they won't, stupid question, because once you know what this thing does, it takes away 80%, 90% of my pain. That's what it does. So this is the, the approach that we are taking, and um, it's difficult. It's not as easy as it sounds, but we are, we are committed to use AI and use the A as augmented in, in that case to help the human being. And another example I just want to show because I love it is um, we did that for Ducati um, to win a race, uh, to win a, a motorcycle GP race, and Ducati just won one last week in the World Championship. Um, you have a thousand parameters that the engineers before each race have to adjust. One parameter you can't. It's a human being, the driver, on the bike. And the driver determines with his body position seconds on the lap. So the race, by the end of the day, is won literally by the driver and by the way he sits on the bike. So our people developed a neural network, put the camera in behind, filming, filming the, 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 the driver, run the pictures in a neural net, and learn how to identify body composition. And by doing that, um, they were able to predict and compute lap times based on body position on the bike, arms, the back, the legs and everything. So the accuracy was striking at more than 99%. The algorithm was able to predict the lap time of the driver based on his body uh, position. It's a 10 layer um, neural net. With that, the engineers didn't feel, oh my God, we're going to lose our job. It's a tool that helps them and help the driver to become just better. So they want to have it. Now we're using that technology for um, Formal e-racing and for other areas, um, because it's it's really a, a very cool technology. So maybe an outlook: what, where do we believe uh, the journey could go? Technologies are converging right now. We have machine learning, uh, which is a, a very very robust technology, cloud technology, and quantum computing.
coming, so we will see quantum machine learning as one of the most powerful technologies in the next four to five years. The Google guy said um, two hours ago, probably four years, Teal is a, a robust commercial product. It can be obtained probably much earlier, but this is going to change the world dramatically. And um, the way networks learn, we can simulate data. We don't need live data anymore. We can simulate data, create artificial data sets. We can auto-generate algorithms that change themselves to become better, to improve. And, um, and bots, as I showed, that learn, take on new tasks. So the procurement bot, maybe four weeks later, takes on new tasks by itself, buying stuff more than 10,000 euros, maybe switching over into finance, doing all the financial approvals, becoming then a finance bot. So why not letting that guy develop and learn itself and come back with new, new, um, new, uh, new ideas? So after a bottle of wine, two of my friends and myself spend an evening in a bar in, in Wolfsburg, which you need really a bottle of wine if you want to spend a night there in Wolfsburg and having fun. Anyway, and we said, why don't we, why don't we try to apply Asimov on AI? And this is just the first draft. I mean, you go out, take it, and do the second or third draft. So AI may not harm or for an action allow a human to be harmed. And that is a powerful statement. It means AI should not overpower a human being or replace a human being by any means. AI must be controlled by humans. The red button, the stop, has to be a human touch. We have to say stop and stop an algorithm from, from acting or change it actively. Uh, that should be done by, by the human being, unless it conflicts with law, law one. And the third one is also important. Let an algorithm be able to learn itself and to become better and better and better, not to stop it. Don't put too many EU regulations in place. DSGVO, GDPR, is a very strong regulation with all the benefits, but also some negatives. So you have to be very careful to over-regulate systems from a legal standpoint, but to be sure that we control them from an intellectual standpoint and know what's, what's happening, and put in the stop buttons where humans can, can just put things to hold. So conclusion. Our industry, and we are really lucky to be in that industry, has many opportunities for applied AI. And, um, but again, it should work for the human being and shouldn't be a threat. And uh, this is an important thing. Cognitive ergonomics, why not using it? Like in the factory 50 years ago, to make our lives and business easier, travel planning, travel booking, or whatever, whatever. Why, why can't a bot do that? And um, we are committed to open source. All we do is open source. We open source our quantum algorithms. Just an example, the algorithm we developed to optimize traffic in Beijing on a quantum machine is now used um, by university in Japan to predict tsunamis and help by uh, tsunami recovery by tracking people's smartphone and compute exit ways to get away from tsunami danger areas. So it shows that something can be really used for the better if it's open source, if it's for the public. And we are absolutely committed to do that. And again, the combination of it all is going to be very powerful, a very powerful statement for our future. Having said that, we think augmented human AI is augmenting human intelligence, and future is fun. Thank you very much, and that's the end of my presentation.
Thank you. So, thanks. <laughs> We received already some questions. Maybe we can put it on the slide. So let's start with the first one. It's from Harald, and he asked, you mentioned the collaboration with startups. What can large companies like Volkswagen learn from them? I would say everything. <laughs> and this, the question is, what would you pull out of it? I mean. Startups have one thing, there's no fear, a lot of creativity, and speed. This is what, what makes a startup interesting for us. Second of all, brilliant people. I mean, people who run their own business are per definition bright people. So, so you have a, an incredible setting to learn from. The, um, what we specifically can learn is to combine how do you start an idea and then to scale it. Because our strength is we know how to scale. We can scale things. And if you make the perfect match, then I think if the right startup meets the right people in our company, not everyone has the same mindset, but then I think a, a marriage can, can be done. Mm -hmm. The next one is, what do you say to people who are afraid of AI and all the digitalization? That's the second question, right? What do people say? The second one. The second one. Yeah, it's, uh, it moved. So. I mean, Every technology has its risk, there's no doubt about it. And I think there's a right to be afraid. And uh, being afraid is a very important human, human, human uh, trait. And there's a reason for that. And the question is, how do you address the reason for it? If everything is confined in a black box, algorithms feel, feel watching you, then there's fear, which is a right to be afraid of. In return, if you see in that box a glass box, exactly what's happening, and you control it, then different scenario. I mean, the point is you have to show people, open the box, what is in, and then the fear factor is minor. But uh, if you do everything in a Silicon Valley-based housing, where the whole world doesn't know what you're doing, only money, this is what's creating the situation we're in today. So that's why I'm advocating open sourcing is one element to it, be open, transparent, we as a company learned that in the last two years, that openness is one of the most important things to be on people's side. So this would be my, my take on it. Mm -hmm. And the next one is, is legislative regulating AI a threat for your work and why? That, that's a good one. I mean, I mean, it's plus and minus. If you look at uh, GDPR, um, we are lucky to have one rule in Europe. That's the great story about it. The not so great story about it is that you try to regulate things that are not even understood today. I mean, now we have the impact of GDPR and to deal with it. I mean, the, the question is, you only regulate what you are afraid of and what you can't control. And you can do it by either a law or by education or by solutions. And one solution could be open sourcing. If I were a regulator, I would rather have opted for an open source law. Say so it's mandatory to open source. Fear is gone. Op and show what the data is that you're dealing with and what you're doing with it. I mean, algorithms collecting data and coming back with a commercial to me, I don't like it anymore. Four years it was cool that Amazon knew that I like milk. Now it's not. So it's changing over time. And uh, I, I doubt that regulators can take care of that. Do you believe in singularity? If so, when? Will it happen, and should we take care? Which one was it? Do you believe in singularity? If so, when will it happen? <laughs> should we take care? Well, I, we, we spend a lot of time with the singularity people. I mean, do I believe in 2040 that our brain can be dumped somewhere else and we live forever? No, I don't. But I believe in, uh, in some core, core elements. Um, the basis foundation for singularity is exponential technologies. And I'm a heavy believer in it because data proves it. You don't have to believe you know it. I mean, we have technologies that accelerate out of nothing behind our back. And if you look at um, artificial intelligence, we had it in the 70s and was quiet. The big, the big jump was in the last two years. If you look at quantum computing, same is happening again. If you look at solar cells implemented, from a very low, low level over 10 years, in the last four or five years, it's skyrocketed. So, so I believe in the fundamentals of singularity. 
I don't believe in all the interpretation of it. And what is the biggest challenge for Volkswagen to transform into the best mobility provider? <laughs> to be honest right now is finding, finding the right people. Um, finding the right people in a very competitive market who, who are able to work on this. Um, this that's the biggest challenge. It's, it's, not, it's not our mindset, it's not our attitude. We're way beyond this. Now finding the people to do this. And um, if you look at artificial intelligence, finding people in the market who know what they're doing is very limited. Uh, we're not producing enough talent right now in our universities to feed that demand. So, so people who are knowledgeable and motivated and getting them on board and keeping them is the biggest challenge that I think everyone is facing. How will Volkswagen out-innovate companies like Google for AI applications? I don't know if out-innovate is possible, to be <laughs> blunt and honest, and I don't think it's necessary. Why should we outsource for billions uh, Google? We have areas where we think uh, we, we can be better than other companies, where we will out, out, outsmart other companies, and other areas where we accept lagging behind. There's nothing bad in life sometimes. I don't have to run a marathon in two hours, by the way. I'm happy to do it in four. Do I want to outrun the world champion in marathon? Probably not. Do I want to run fast? Yes, I want. So, so the point is, what are the, 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 the segments where we have a capability, where we ha can have a educated conversation with people from Google knowing this is our area we can do best and that is the other area where they are best. And then if you're smart, you partner, you complement your weaknesses and then you have a winning formula. The next one, as a car company which care about quality and safety, how do you handle the AI which become a black box and no longer make full control on the process? That's a very good uh, discussion. Uh, I think we don't have the solution so far. Why? Because we are all, all of us. And uh, probably Waymo is furthest down the road, are working on, on our algorithms. And um, every car supplier is doing that, uh, Bosch, Conti. So, so it's, a, it's, a big, it's, a, it's a big community working on these algorithms. Um, the point will come where the legislator will say, we have to open source it. So um, till then, we need enough time to, to get our homework done before we present our homework. We have two questions, but we have to move on. So thank you, Dr. Martin thank you. Hofmann. Thanks again. Big applause. <laughs>